Hello, and welcome to the Blue Wizard Reviews, where we look at book-based movies and critique the deviations they make from the source, down to the microscopic level. Today, we're going to go back a few years and start off with Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Watching this movie again, I was really surprised to see how much it sticks to the original source material. At a time when making money seems to be more important than the story itself, it was kind of refreshing to go back and watch this again. That being said, there are some major changes that have quite a drastic effect on the story being told. The first is when Hagrid reveals to Harry that he's a wizard. In the book, Hagrid is righteously outraged that Harry has no idea where he's from, what happened to his parents, or what he means to the wizarding world. In the movie, Hagrid's more mildly annoyed about it, even when it comes to standing up for Dumbledore. Now, most people would just write this off as an artistic license by the directors. However, because the revealing of what happened to Harry and his parents is moved from here to Diagon Alley, the feeling that's set for the rest of the story is altered. The whole backdrop is changed. In the book, you feel Hangry's anger and his hurt at being betrayed by his aunt and uncle and sets the stage for the changing narrative between Harry and the Dursleys in the books to come. In the movies, they really dumb down this feeling, just kind of making you feel sad that Harry's lost his parents. Going on from that, this leads to the second major error the film makes, one which proves that if you don't correct a mistake at the very beginning, it can cause drastic ruin everywhere else. I'm talking, of course, about the word Voldemort. In the movies, it's made fairly clear. It's made clear fairly early on that Voldemort made sure that even his name would be feared. The movies fail horribly in keeping this consistency. The first time Hagrid says the name, he stutters and mumbles, obviously afraid to say it. But then he says it a second time, with no hesitation whatsoever. Just a few seconds later. Hermione's given the same problem. She has no issue with saying Voldemort in the movie, which I like since she's muggle-born and therefore has no experience with wizarding society, but a few movies on, we'll see that she's made to act as if she's been scared of the name the entire time. I'm sure a lot of blame for this can be placed on the constantly changing string of directors that were associated with this series, but really part of the fear and the dread and the real hatred you have for Voldemort comes from the fact that the characters in the book consistently refuse to say his name, with the notable exceptions of Harry and Dumbledore. While the cons when this consistency is not enforced, we really lose that dread and that fear and that hatred for Voldemort, and it really degrades it when Voldemort appears in the fourth book in his physical form. In the books, you see fear and feel fear and really know that this character is something to not mess around with. In the movies, it's just kind of, eh, here's our villain. Another thing that happens is that it also degrades the sense of notoriety that's given to Dumbledore in the books. When everyone else is wishy-washy between you-know-who and Voldemort, who really cares if a main character just says Voldemort all the time? And really, that's all the main plot changes here. The movie, as I said, stays quite faithful to the book. Everything else really is a nitpick. I just want to comment on two other changes that, while not changing the storyline, are fairly significant each in their own right. The first is Norbert. Uh, the scene seems very short, really a transition to the Forbidden Forest, but in all honesty, while I would have loved to see Charlie and the whole escape plan, it seems rather strange to me that Charlie and his friends would have been perfectly fine with taking an illegal dragon and transporting it over international borders. The only thing that really suffers from this cut in the movie is Neville. You get a real sense of betrayal when he's by Hermione. It's much more palpable in the books. Because he's caught trying to warn Harry, Ron, and Hermione about Malfoy knowing about the dragon. In the movie, that betrayal is a little less poignant and kind of makes Neville look like a point grabber than a true friend standing up for his house. The second little change I was very surprised to find caused an enormous amount of controversy. While I'm certainly happy to let sleeping dogs lie, let me just say here and now that there is nowhere, and I mean nowhere in the books, that says what position James Potter played on the Gryffindor Quidditch team. 
He is mentioned as having been a player, and is he is seen later playing with a snitch that he bewitched. Uh, suggestive, it is by no means any kind of hard proof. J.K. Rowling herself has said that James was a chaser, not a seeker. Here's the reference for the interview. That being said, this is one of those very rare times when a movie adds something that you wish had been in the book because it betters the overall story. Harry sees his father's name with a winning plaque, may or may not have achieved Hermione's goal of making him feel more confident in his upcoming Quidditch match, but it also gives us as the audience a very palpable sense of what it's like to be in Harry's shoes, where everyone else really does know more about him than he does. It kind of makes up a little bit for that lack of anger and betrayal that we would have felt in the books if Hagrid's righteous indignation had been put into the movies. And that's all I have. It's time for Nitpick Corner, where we pick apart every little misdemeanor the movie has ever made against the golden standard of the book. No magical accidents from Harry in the beginning of the movie, except for the snake. Kind of makes Vernon's warning about no funny business seem kind of unusual. Hagrid taking Harry to the train station. It would have been a nice opportunity for the Dursleys to be more subtle in their meanness by just leaving him there and driving off like they did in the books. Hagrid disappearing after giving Harry his ticket. Hagrid really doesn't have any magic, so to speak of, so what? Did he have a magical item that just made him go poof? Hermione's looks, just hear me out on this one. She doesn't have buck teeth. Now, this doesn't really make any difference now, because she's only an 11-year-old kid, but it makes quite a big difference in book four when she has her transformation from dorky kid to beautiful, smart young woman. The Sorting Hat. I would have liked it better if the Sorting Hat had not spoken out loud. You can tell everybody hears it because Professor McGonagall pulls away after putting the hat on Ron. Also, what the heck ever happened to calling people up in alphabetical order? Quidditch rules. What the heck was McGonagall looking at when those fouls occurred in the first match? You can't hit a bludger at a keeper while he's in the scoring area, and you can't rough up a chaser so badly that she's knocked unconscious against the stands. I mean, obviously it's cut for time, but seriously, come on, it's a game, it has rules. Not enough Quidditch. Enough said. No Protein Dreams test. While they're going for the Sorcerer's Stone, Hermione kind of shows her brilliance with the Devil's Snare, but honestly, I really liked how she was portrayed figuring out Snape's little logical riddle. Quirrell dying. I liked it a bit better when he just got boils. It didn't kill him, but Voldemort left him anyway, just because Quirrell was as useless to him now, since he couldn't kill Harry, as if he had died. Makes Voldemort seem a little bit more evil, which I like. Dumbledore's whispering. Honestly, did the man say anything in a normal sort of voice? And that's all, folks. Join me next time for the Blue Wizard review of Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets.